Peace be with you. I am Pastor Stephen Jurdy at Zion and Bethany Lutheran Churches, and this is the Sunday Morning Bible Study for Sunday, March 7th. We are in the book of Mark. Someone just pulled me aside after worship today and said, I heard that Peter wrote Mark. Is that right? And you may recall as we went over the study, uh, or as we started the study a few weeks ago, uh, Mark did indeed get his information from St. Peter. That's what the tradition of the church says. We have no particular reason to doubt that tradition as it comes very early in the church's life. And in fact, we have every reason to believe it because we know that the Gospel of Mark reflects something of the character of Peter that we see in the other Gospels, uh, that he's a somewhat brash man. And so Mark, every, in Mark, everything's happening uthus, which is Greek for immediately. Everything's happening uthus, 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 kai uthus, and immediately. And so just with as with Peter, Peter's always rushing in. We also know that there are some eyewitness details that seem to be added to Mark um, at certain points, like the fact that there was much green grass where Jesus fed the 5,000. And there's some other details as well, as well as uh, continual, not preoccupation with, but continual noting of Peter. There's a continual mentioning of Peter a continual mentioning of what he did, uh, thought what he did, what he said, how he fits into the whole gospel narrative. So uh, some interesting reasons there to, to find confirmation within the text itself that this information comes from Peter, the disciple of the Lord. Just think, folks, these, this all comes from real people, real people for your very real Lord Jesus um, people who are just like you and me and who were convinced that Jesus is risen from the dead. That's just really phenomenal when we, when we stop and think about that. So today we are in Mark chapter 7, and let's just get right into it. I'll start reading at verse 1 of Mark chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. That's important for a little bit later. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You lead the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me as Corbin, that is, given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Let's pause there. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. So, let's talk about washing hands and pots and pans and dining couches. So, the people of Israel at this time had the ritual of, as it says, washing many things in preparation for eating. Now, the question is, why did they do that? Did they do that because they understood hygiene and no one else did? Certainly, washing the hands did give to the Jews a certain level of hygiene that was valuable to their bodily health. But the reason why they did that was different. It was for religious reasons. It was for, as a way of, of confessing that they um, had clean hearts. Is a way of saying of saying that, or seeking to say that. Is a way of saying they're clean before God. Is a way of being righteous before God by observing this ritual, not hygienic, not with soap and water, but this more ritual cleansing of the hands as well as pots and pans, and even dining couches. Now, what are dining couches? So at this time, they do not have chairs and tables like you and I do. They tend to uh, recline, so they recline with their feet away from the table, their head and their uh, arms towards the table. They they lean on their left arm so they can reach with their right arm to get food. That's how everyone was taught to do it in the ancient world. And they even clean the dining couches. So they, they clean everything with water. They wash everything with water. They baptize everything with water that is brought into service of the meal, including dining couches. Now, this is one side note people have noted that there is not a lot of, of water in ancient Israel. And yet this says they wash their dining couches. And the word term that they use for it is baptizo, which means to baptize. It's the same word for baptize. They baptize their dining couches. And the reason why that is significant is because it, it helps settle this somewhat silly debate within the church. Uh, over time, there's been debates within the churches over whether or not a person has to be fully immersed uh, in order to be baptized. And uh, there are those who say that, yes, you must be fully immersed in order to be baptized, want to insist in some of their arguments that the verb baptizo requires that definition, that baptizo meant to immerse in water. There is, however, as people point out, no way that people are running around with their dining couches submersing dining couches in water and and completely submerging them. <laughs> it meant they washed them. They washed their hands. They washed their pots and pans. They baptizo their dining couches. They washed them. So, so baptism is more of a washing. And that's why from we find indications from the early church that people were just washed with the water. Uh, it was poured over them for the sake of washing them as opposed to an actual submersion, total immersion. Um, but that's sort of a side note to the larger issue, which is they now are coming to Jesus and saying, well, how come, Jesus, you don't wash your hands? And we, we might stop, of course, with our super-duper concern for hygiene these days. And this was even before COVID-19 hit, that people had a high concern for hygiene, which is probably why COVID-19 affected us the way it did, because we were so very concerned for hygiene in our culture, for many good reasons. Uh, that we hear that Jesus did not wash his hands and we think, what's going on with Jesus? What, what's wrong with you? Why aren't your disciples washing their hands? Again, it wasn't about being clean. It's about being ritually pure and before God. It was about being in conformity with God's law. So what Jesus says then to them is this whole concern you have about running around and washing down your dining couches and, and, and washing your pots and your pans and your hands, uh, this, this is the traditions of men and does not actually keep the commandment of God. And, and we'll, he goes very deep with that. But the first example he gives is regarding parents, which is interesting to me. Uh, the parents. And, you know, there's certain points where Jesus mentions parents and goes to the issue of how parents are to treat their children how children are to treat their parents. Uh, remember John the Baptist was sent to turn the hearts of father towards their sons and the hearts of sons towards their fathers, which is very uh, significant sort of insight as to the, into the ministry of John the Baptist and the ministry of faith in general. Faith turns us towards our parents. Faith turns us towards the earth 
as God has created it. That's the main thing. God has created it so that every human being on earth comes into the earth with a fa- through a father and a mother. Therefore, every person on earth has a father and mother, even if someone's being raised only by one of their parents. We're not here, or if they're being raised in some other um, family sort of construction or design, um, the, the design that comes from heaven is father and mother. And so um, faith turns us towards that. Faith teaches us to love and to desire the things that God desires. And clearly God desires mother and father. He desires that pairing of mother and father. So then what Jesus says here is you have this human tradition of saying that if you give tithes, and if you give offerings above and beyond your tithe, that can, you can call Corbin, which is just a term meaning bound to the bound to being used above and beyond the tithe, beyond above and beyond what the law of Moses requires. And therefore, you do not have to use it to support your parents. So no one can come to you and say, you aren't supporting your parents. Uh, you are spending all your money in the temple. You can say, oh, that's Corbin. That's above and beyond my tithe. That's devoted to spiritual uses. Therefore, you can't complain at me that I'm not taking care of my parents. Jesus points out, faith turns us not only towards God, but towards mother and father. And therefore, faith says, I'm going to love and take care of my parents. Remember where faith comes from. Faith comes from the heart. And so faith is the main thing. And that's what he's really taking issue here with the Pharisees. Reminds me, we did a little bit of family genealogy. This this is an interesting, this is a very interesting thing. We did a little family genealogy in my family. We, we traced back the Norwegian side of our family. We have several, I'm kind of a mutt, a, a Northern European mutt. Uh, Germany, uh, conquered Dane, as my family called it, uh, people who were Danish and conquered by Germany. No, mostly Norwegian, Swedish, and who knows what else. But uh, we, were, we were looking at the Norwegian side of it, and then my other side, no, my wife's side is another issue. But we were looking at the Norwegian side of it, and, um, and we found the, the, earliest, the earliest person we found was from the late 1600s. And he was taken to court by the parish or county, basically. We, we would say the county, for not paying enough money for his parents. And he was fined for not supporting his parents as he was supposed to do. And he had to give that money to the county because the county had to pick up the money to care for his parents. And if the county is picking up money to care for his parents, the county is saying, you are the child, you have responsibility to do this, so you have to repay the county. I don't think we have that. And it's interesting that we don't. Uh, there seems to be a deeply Christian biblical recognition in that sort of law that says, well, you're the child, time to support your parents. And wouldn't that maybe change the way we use our money and plan our lives a little bit? Just a thought. I'm not sort of trying to guilt anyone there or send any zingers out or hidden messages. It's really just a thought uh, that this passage of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 7, raises for us that he should choose parents as the example of how people at that time were not really keeping the commandments. And he thus affirms the importance of parents and teaches us that faith turns us not only towards God, but also towards our parents, which as we know can be difficult because parents can be difficult. Being a child can be difficult. It's not easy, but that's where faith leads us. My favorite story of that is of a woman who I knew she does not live in the area she lives away from here and had a very difficult relationship with her uh, parent, with her father, and then found out he was and, and left home young, very young, to get away from him uh, for good reasons, for very good reasons. And then when she found out he was dying when she was about 50, 40 to 50 years old, she went back and cared for him because the rest of his family had abandoned him. And she did that specifically because she said, I'm a Christian and I believe in the fourth commandment. I must fulfill it. I must listen to that, shouldn't I, pastor? I said, indeed. And so she went and did that. It was really amazing to me. So amazing things God does in us here. 
But then he goes on and takes this even deeper, because remember where faith comes from. Faith comes from the Bible. And so then he makes the further point, and he says, look, what you eat, if you're washing all this stuff to keep your food clean so it's not ritually defiling to you, it can't defile you. It just goes into your tum-tum, and then you expel it, he says. Rather polite term for what happens. And it goes out into the sewer, he says, in a different passage, I believe. I don't think that's this one, right? Yeah, he says it in a different passage. I forget which one that is. Matthew, maybe. It goes out in the sewer. It can't defile you. It doesn't stay in you. But what comes from your heart, that can defile you. Because what do the commandments seek? The commandments seek that you love, that you desire, that you trust in and cherish and want God above all things, and that you then also desire and cherish and serve and love your neighbor as yourself. That calls to functions of the heart. That points us to functions of the heart. And if out of our heart comes a desire for things more than God, if out of our heart comes a desire to harm our neighbor and not to love him, um, and, and a desire to cherish things more than God, then our heart is defiling us. And then he gives a long list here. And I mean, by the time we're done reading the list, none of us are free, right? None of us are free. I, I mean, I don't care who we are. But by the time he gets done listing all the things that come out of the heart of man, evil thoughts, I mean, I think we're all done right there, aren't we? <laughs> we're done before we got started. Evil thoughts. Oh, right. Those. Sexual immorality. Theft. Murder. Adultery. Coveting. Oh, right. Wickedness. Deceit. Sensuality. Envy. Mm. Slander. Uh, pride. Ouch. Foolishness. Oh, I'm not a fool. <laughs> as soon as you say so, you are, right? And so uh, this whole long list of things that just leave us all going, yeah, we're defiled in our heart, and leave us then seeking a deeper cleansing and a deeper purity. What could that purity be? Well, let's read on, verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. Ooh, we'll talk about that. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way, the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after t spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's also the end of chapter 7. So, uh, Syrophoenician, coming from the regions of Tyre and Sidon, this harkens back. It's amazing how long history is held on to in Scripture and in the life of God's people and indeed in the Word of God, which reminds us then that history matters even to God. Time, which we tend to look at as our enemy, is rather the handmaiden of God, if I might put it that way. Um, it's... Time is the servant of God. Time, God created time. It's good, therefore. Time is not the enemy. We think it is because we're sinners. But that's just sin's the problem, not time. So God holds on to history and uses it. So here we are, you know, a long time after the conquest of the, of the promised land. This is like a thousand years after King David. And King David is, what, four or five hundred years after the conquest of Israel. I mean, he's 
it's a while anyway. Some of that gets debated as to when it actually happened. But we're talking at 15 centuries since the conquest of Israel and, and the ethnic designation of someone is brought up in order to connect us back to that time. Syrophoenician meant people who dwelt in the promised land before Israel took possession of it. And therefore, Syrophoenicians were people who were Gentile, were not part of the part of the promised people, the chosen people, and therefore who had no claim on the promised land, and who, in the views of many, should not even be living on the promised land. And so you hear the word Phoenician in there, coastal peoples, people who lived in Tyre and Sidon. These are people who come from the Philistines. Remember David killing uh, Goliath, the Philistine giant? So this woman comes, she has in her DNA, as it were, in her gene genealogy, the, the Philistines, the Phoenicians, and the Syrians. And, and the Syrians, you know, they're from north of there, well, yeah, sort of northeast, but they, they come from a land that was traditionally an enemy of Israel. And so this woman has no claim on Jesus because Jesus came to the Jews. Jesus is a Jew. He's a Jewish rabbi. She has no ethnic claim on him. And he draws that out. He says, well, you know, you want me to help your daughter, but I'm here for the, for the Jews first. I'm here for Israel first. And then after the children are fed, then the dogs are fed. A lot of people take great offense at that. That has more to do probably with our language than the language of the time. We look at being called a dog as being a very negative thing. It's not necessarily a positive thing. Now, it is used in the book of Revelation in a very negative way. Here, it's a little different term. Um, this is a term, I remember talking about this with Pastor Johnson as he preached on this text not too long ago. The term here for dog is little is the term used for little puppy dogs, um, not necessarily the dogs you find on the streets, but the little puppy dogs you keep in your home. So you know this is not a mutt. This is not the term for mutts. This is the this is the term for a for a Maltese poo, <laughs> a Maltese and poodle, right? Mix or a, or a where, where's the other little ones, Cabanese or something like that. So um, he's just simply using a parable to say there's an order. Jews first, and then you Gentiles. And then she says, and then she says, yes, Lord. She agrees with him. This is important to see. Instead of opposing him, arguing with him, she agrees with him. And she says, yes, Lord. Uh, and even the, But even the dogs get the crumbs. And for that conformity to what Jesus has to say, for finding herself within what Jesus has to say and saying yes, and also in a very rabbinical way, uh, they therefore get the crumbs too. He says, great is your faith. Great is her faith because she accepts what Jesus gives her and she fully occupies and inhabits it. She even inhabits it to the point of claiming more promise there than was initially seen. And there then is the picture of faith. There is the picture of what cleanses our hearts to fully occupy what Jesus gives us and to claim even more promise there than the eye might initially see. This, that, that's really the definition of Christian life, to fully inhabit, fully receive and inhabit what Jesus gives us as he gives it to us, and to claim even more promise there than we might initially see. And, uh, and for that, then she goes home and her daughter is cured. So now there's the cure, not just of her daughter, there's the cure of the defiled human heart. The defiled human heart desire, desires Jesus. In, in its defilement, the heart is drawn by the Spirit to desire Jesus, to desire what Jesus gives us, to desire to inhabit what Jesus gives us. And in that desire, which is what we call faith, and I know faith and desire don't sound like they belong together, and we can maybe pause and talk about that. But within that desire, which is what we call faith, um, the human heart is cleansed in a, in a deeper way. Even though the human heart continues to struggle with sin, it has a righteousness that is not born of its faithfulness to the law, but of the gift of Christ alone, which is the whole point, really, of this chapter. And then that, cha that point is emphasized even more when he heals the deaf man because of the way he heals the deaf man. It just, it's, even from our modern ears, it's like icky because here Jesus spits, right? Let me reread that part. He uses saliva. He put his finger into his ears, and after spitting, 
I think that means spitting on his hand. It doesn't say that specifically. I don't think Jesus just spits on the ground. Jesus spits on his hand and then touches the man's tongue. What, what's going on here? Uh, and then he looks up to heaven, he sighs, he sighs. I mean, he just this is so very human. And so he touches the man's ears. He puts his fingers actually in the ears. Like that. Puts his fingers in the ears. Maybe he, you know, what's he doing? <laughs> that must be a great shot on, on live stream. But, you know, he's doing, he's kind of doing this to the ears. And he spits on his hands. And then he rubs the saliva on the man's tongue. And he looks up to heaven and he sighs. And then he says, Ephatha, Ephatha, be opened. And so this is Jesus really giving of himself. This is Jesus. This is a deep physical contact between Jesus and the deaf man. And uh, that's really significant because it, re it, it says something about the, about the, the very body of Jesus, the very physicality of Jesus, that Jesus in all of his members is pure because now he can touch people and they are healed. He can, he can even, his, even his saliva is a cure and a remedy for people. Weird, but weird in the classical sense of the word weird, where it is different, it's strange, it's otherly from the life that we know, but that's just it. The problem isn't Jesus, the problem is us, that we aren't that way, we aren't that life-giving in our flesh, Jesus is. A, a brief excursus on faith and desire before I jump into chapter 8. It's 1042. Um, faith and desire. So faith. What is faith? Greek word pistis is the is a Greek word for faith. Pistis. Uh, pistuo is the verb. And the English is believe from believe. If you can, if you can imagine English people speaking more like Dutch and German people back in the day, they, they were believers, not believers, believe. And leib, lieben, leben, a uh, heart. So to believe in someone, to believe in someone is to lodge your heart in that person. So there are strong overtones of desiring, uh, with, with the word faith. Uh, also, that, that is there in, in the Greek, uh, in that, you know, God is described as pistis. God is described as faithful. And what makes God faithful? Well, he displays that colorfully throughout the Old Testament, that he desires his people. And he desires their salvation. So Jesus says, earnestly, I have desired to have this supper with you. He weeps over Jerusalem, how I've desired to gather your hands and your chicks as a hen, or, um your chicks as a hen gathered you to me as a hen gathers her chicks. There's a desire to the faithfulness of God. There's a desire then also to faith. So to understand what faith is, you know, and Martin Luther does this in his catechism, the very first commandment. We are to fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So love is part of faith. We sometimes chop all these things up. In systematic theology, that is, in the, in the system, systematic study of theology, we make distinctions. And the distinctions are important. This is not a, a rejection of systematic theology at all. But it's but once we make those distinctions, then we it's good to see that what we distinguish, Scripture holds together. And so faith and love are really part of the deal, faith and desiring. And this is helpful because this also helps us understand statements like Jesus, when he says, faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. What does that mean? Well, just you don't have to desire Jesus perfectly. You know, just want him. Just, just want to believe in him. I don't know how many people I've met who are like, I wish I could believe in Jesus. And, I'm, and it took me a couple years in ministry before I started being able to say to them, look, if you wish you believed in Jesus, you do believe in Jesus. <laughs> Maybe you don't have the level of faith and faithfulness that you think you should have, but if you want that, that already is desiring him. It's trusting him to be what he is supposed to be. You are trusting him to be what he is supposed to be, even if he is not yet occupying that position in all of your thoughts, words, and deeds. You desire him to do that. You're trusting in him. And that, of course, we're told in Scripture is what justifies us to... Um, want Jesus. That alone. 
to trust in him, to trust him to provide everything necessary and to do everything necessary. And then, so that's maybe a, a final comment too, in the, this traditions of men versus the commandments of God distinction, because people often will take that and, and they will try to use that to reject all the traditions of a church or church life that they can't find in the Bible, especially the ones that really bother them. Uh, because here's the, here's the thing. Every church has traditions, right? Every church has a traditional way of doing it. Even if a church's tradition is to have, for example, no images or no pictures or no singing, um, well, that's still a tradition. It, it, maybe you're giving, getting rid of a tradition, but you're adopting a new one. You just We can't get away from it. The problem is not traditions themselves. It is whether what place they occupy and are they are they being used as a source of righteousness instead of the commandments are we teaching do this and you're fine even if you you know hate your parents and kill your neighbor and commit adultery and steal but you know just um say these certain prayers or or bow this many times and you're just fine that's where that's where traditions of men become problematic where traditions of men are simply ordering a common life so that we have a common way of confessing the faith, a common way of conveying the faith, and a common way of worship, that's a different thing. That's, that's a different thing for as long as it does not become the righteousness where we're like, no, we have to do this or else we're, we're going to be damned unless we do this. Uh, no church officially does that. Many churches fall into doing that. And we do have some beefs as Protestants with some of the Roman Catholic rules on this subject. Uh, and Lutherans would have beefs with some of, you know, some evangelical Christians too, who want to say, well, you know, if you if you pray a law, if you pray a written prayer, it's not really a prayer. God doesn't hear it, which is sort of like saying, God, if God doesn't hear you, you're damned, dude. You're on the outside. If God doesn't hear you, so if you only pray written prayers, then you're like unheard. God never says that. If you pray with faith, that's the thing. So if you pray a pr written prayer with faith, it's the same as praying a composed prayer in your head with faith. Uh, and let's not forget, there's, there, is, there is a lapse of time between composing it in your head and speaking it with your mouth. And so, you know, if, what's, what's really the difference, really, in the end? So that's, you know, that's an example of, of where we would differ. Or in the Roman Catholic side, you know, you know there's, there's, indulgences are still a thing. So you if you bow towards a cross held in a procession, um, it shaves off. I think it was like if you if you bow towards a cross when it comes past you in procession and and pray a certain prayer, it shaves off twelve years from purgatory. That too, we would say that's a tradition of man that does not support the commandments of God. Martin Luther always said, "The commandments of God are enough to occupy you the rest of your life." And also, of course, even that does not save you. It is the gift of Jesus Christ alone. So this is not to, to condemn Roman Catholics or to condemn evangelicals. It's to say, here's where that, where that is distinguished so that we understand what's going on with the traditions and commandments of man debate. What Jesus is going after is where traditions are exalted in place of commandments and are presented as righteousness and the way you're going to have righteousness before God. Then there's a problem. If that's not happening, if it's just ordering a common life, um, it's just fine. And we see the early church doing that, in fact. Meeting, gathering on the Lord's Day, for example. Gathering their home on the Lord's Day. It's a tradition. And uh, and yet it's a tradition that church has held onto for all these years. 1049. Uh, yeah, let's wait for uh, chapter 8 until next week. So God's peace be with you. Uh, Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus is your life, your holiness. He makes you pure. Desire him, want him, trust him, love him, take him, receive him. He's given himself away all the time, so he is yours. And just, just take him. Peace be with you.